Welcome everybody to our monthly MARG meeting. We're so glad to have you here. If you see my eyes darting, it's because I'm doing, I'm taking attendance on two screens. So I'm, I'm not, a, I am distracted, but not in a bad way. <laughs> um, my name is Sharela. For those of you that do not know me, I work in Frontiers and I am the Community Programs Project Manager. <clears throat> I work very closely with Drs. Alan Greiner and Dr. Jill Peltzer as we um, we do Mark. We do the, the Mark group, and um, we're just happy to have you here. And this will be the first of many other training sessions that we have with our Mar group. I'm really, really excited for today. I'm so glad that Kelly and Megan were able to join us because we really do want this to be a space where people aren't just presenting information, but so that we can actually get better at things as well. And so as you may have noticed in the invitation, <clears throat> Kelly's going to talk about how to give an elevator pitch. Hopefully when you do research <clears throat> and you're trying to describe what it is, it can be something that is done quickly and succinctly where you can describe it and Kelly's gonna help us do that. And as you continue to involve community partners and community advocates as you write grants, Megan is gonna give us some best practices on that. Um, but before we start, I did want to ask if there was anyone new on the call. I don't I don't think we have any new people on the call, do we? Is this anyone's first time? Besides Megan, of course. Okay, no, I don't think so. Um, and uh, what I would like to start doing is make sure that we have time for announcements. So, Kathy, for example, I know you have to leave uh, before the meeting is over. So if there's anything you want to announce, please drop it in the chat or send it to me directly. And at the end of our meeting, we will go over all those things. And as you guys have been receiving our MARG newsletter, I, I shouldn't call it a newsletter because it's really just an email compilation of things. And um, hopefully you've been receiving those. So whenever you want something to go out to our MAR group, please send it to me. I will make sure that it gets disseminated. If it's timely, like this can't wait a week. I need people to register for this right away. Just put that in the email as well. Um, and I'll make sure it gets out. Alan, do you have anything? Let me put this in the chat. Nothing that can't wait. Well, I'll talk about a couple things maybe at the end when we're doing announcements, but I think we can just jump right in. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to start with Kelly Hale. She is our awesome communication specialist here. No, communications coordinator is your official title. Is that correct, yeah. Kelly? Okay. Um, and she comes to us from working in the sports world and athletics world as in like you know, Kansas Speedway type world, like she has been doing this for a while. And so she is very well versed on how to give a succinct um, description of what you're doing. And we're excited to see what you have to share with us this morning, Kelly. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's been a while since I have um, done a, a presentation. So let me know if you guys can see this since it doesn't want to let me go into the whole presentation, like page by page. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can see it. it's not in slideshow mode, but we can't yeah, see it. Yeah, won't, it won't let me do that for some okay. reason. So stand by, I'll do it. I have this this issue a lot, you guys. Technology, you would think after this, this long, I would uh, be a little bit better, but. It's not always user error. At least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> Yeah, I had to basically from the beginning on mine in slideshow to get it to work. Yeah, and I, for whatever reason, um, it's just not going to do it today. So we're just going to go with it. Um, but one of the when we do an elevator pitch, um, one of the hardest things that we do is sell ourselves. Is we forget that we are all salespeople. And we will always be salespeople because we're always selling ourselves. Um, one of the hardest things that you probably will encounter is tell me about yourself. And we start talking about, oh, I'm the communications coordinator for Frontiers, or I have children. We we talk about peripheral things, but we don't talk about. I have brown eyes or I have blonde hair. We don't, we don't talk about our awesome skills that we have. 
Um, and that's one of the things that, that we really need to do in an elevator pitch is sell ourselves or sell our product or our service. So what is an elevator pitch? It's brief and catchy, and it's an introduction to you. Think about, you have about 30 to 60 seconds to make an impression on someone, um, which is essentially the time that you're riding an elevator. Um, so as you're doing that, you want, to, you want to share personal stories, you want to spark interest, you want to make, you want to show that what you're doing is making a difference. Essentially, you want to make them care. Um, so that you can have a longer discussion. Um, if you're doing really great research for youth, tell me about it, but tell me why I should care. Um, and when you have personal stories that you can share, that is one of the best things you can do. I was at a conference last year and someone was talking about their research um, with bone density and older Americans and falling and breaking hips. And she's, she's only in her forties. So it was interesting because people weren't doing research on that bone density, but I wasn't really engaged in the, the conversation because I was like, I don't know how this is like really impacting me. And then she started to tell us the story about how she broke her hip. And it involved her dog. And she showed us pictures of her dog. And all of a sudden, everyone in the room kind of sat up a little straighter, um, became a little more engaged. So those are the types of, of things that we're talking about when we talk about sparking an interest or telling a personal story and making that connection. Um, when you're making the elevator pitch, you need to know your audience. And what is your ultimate goal? Um, if your ultimate goal is to get funding, then you need to know that up front because that's going to impact how you make your pitch and how you sell what you're, what you're talking about. Um, the big thing with making a hook is your, again, your personal story. But when we talk about problems, how, what is the problem? Um, if we're talking about um, stroke research or youth obesity um, or youth eating problems in general, that is a problem. But we also need to show that we have a start of a solution and that we need their help to fix that um, problem. And their help, how is it affecting that solution? And one of the biggest things is always practice, always practice your pitch. Um, and I have a few little tips that you wanna write down what, what you wanna say. Obviously you're not gonna do it in the moment. If you know that you have a meeting coming up, that you're pitching your service or a product or even just you, come up with a few bullet points that you wanna that you wanna make sure that you hit. Um, it will help you be clear on what you're talking about, but also too, it'll help those nerves. Um, because as much as we talk to people, we still get nervous. Um, and we still want to make sure that we're getting everything across that we wanna get across in a coherent way. And again, you have about 60 seconds to make that impression. Um, and always remember that you know your product and service, others don't. So you really wanna avoid acronyms. We talk about that a lot at Frontiers. Um, in the CTSA world, there are a lot of acronyms um, and we're still learning them every single day. But also too, you don't wanna use a lot of jargon that is within your group. Um, because again, people don't know that. So um, one of the instances that we have um, is hub research capacity. No one has any idea what that is. I'll tell you, I've been at Frontiers for almost a year. I still have really no idea what that is. 
um, if you just say that term. But if you break it down that we start talking about participant interaction, oh, I know what that is. Or if you talk about recruitment, I know what that is. So make sure that you're making it clear and simple and then make them care. Um, it's always going to go back to that pitch of that personal story. And then here's your four, here are your four takeaways. An elevator pitch is short, personalized, interesting, and you have to be confident. And now what I would like each of you to do is jot down a, a few notes of an elevator pitch, of something that you're going to pitch, whether it's your product, a service, you in general, and then we'll have a couple of people share those. Um, so I'll, let, I'll give you guys the next two to three minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll share some of those. All right, do we have anyone that wants to share? Because if we don't volunteer, I'm probably gonna call on you. I feel like it, it, we're back at school. All right, um, Kathy, would you like to share? I don't know so much that I want to share my elevator pitch, but I, I was thinking that it really depends on what the ask is because I have different facets. Um, like I work with Gilda's Club versus I work with Pivot. Um, so I think some of those things that make it personalized and interesting are really more focused on what's the ask. Would that be, would you agree? No, that's, that's absolutely fair. Um, and then, but as you're selling essentially that service or the product, you can find a way to make it personal mm -hmm. um, because maybe it's not a story directly that impacts you per se, that it, it didn't happen to you or your family, but you have that personal story, <clears throat> excuse me, that will make people care. And that's what's important. Okay. Um, anyone else?
Trayla, do you want to try it? I'm nervous, but yes. <laughs> Again, <laughs> practice, right? For nervous. It's so funny because <clears throat> I just, I really started practicing my elevator pitch as far as what Frontiers is to my friends, because even just describing what Frontiers is and but the one that I was working on today was how to describe, we have a, the Broderick Crawford Community Research Partnership Award that we will be releasing soon. So I've been, I was working on that today, but I don't know if I want to talk it. I'm, I'm really embarrassed about it, but I, um, okay, I, I am. I'm going to start with that. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to start. Hi, nice to meet you. Yes, I'm Sharayla. I work at Frontiers and at the University of Kansas. And I'd like to talk to you really briefly about a mini grant that we have. It is named after the Broderick Crawford, after Broderick Crawford. It's the Broderick Crawford Community Research Partnership Award. I don't know if you have heard of him. Um, he's from Kansas City, Kansas, and he had, was a tireless community advocate. <clears throat> and he actually ended up um, being a co-PI on a project with, with uh, Frontiers and some people here. Um, and unfortunately, he passed away in 2022 um and so in order to to honor him we have named our mini grant after him it's a 1500 to 2000 dollar grant that is designed for people just like broderick and people that work like him that will be able to fulfill a project in the community that perhaps they need funds for that they just need just a little bit to help them reach their goal see it's whack right now but but i'm working on it <laughs> No, um, you have a lot of really strong points, but you know what, one of the things that I think that I might start with mm -hmm. is that you've started a, a grant named, with the name, the full name, mm -hmm. and roll right into, because Broderick was a tireless community advocate, mm -hmm. um, so that's all right there together. Okay. Um, and remember, depending on your um, who you're talking to, mm -hmm. people may not know what a co PI is. See, and I wrote it's it's right here. I wrote that down. Like, oh, <laughs> then I have to say what that is. Okay, you're right. You're right. I, you can't see it, but it's like written and then crossed <laughs> out. I'm like co PI. Oh, you can't see it anyway. Yep. But th I mean, that's just a great example of depending on your audience that yeah. people may not know those acronyms. So you guys, would, is, go ahead. How would you end it? I mean, it's not, I'm not selling, I don't, <clears throat> I really am. It's an informational pitch, right? So it's more like, hey, I don't know if you have a need for this, but we offer this and I'd like to tell you about it, but it needs to be short and it needs to be understood by people that aren't necessarily I don't want to say not researchers, because I think most of the people that we are gearing this towards are people familiar with the research world, even if it's just a little bit. Um, so how do you end it? It's it, I'm not asking you to like, would you be interested in getting more from it? You know, it's like, how do right. I end that? So when you're pitching this to a specific group, mm -hmm. you know what their mission is or to a specific person, you know, the group that they're with and what their mission is. Okay. Um, so you can say, because you're very active in X, we think that this might be a grant that you would be interested in applying for. I like that. Because so. that way it's an, it's engaging too. So I can say, oh, what, where do you work? Or what, what do you work with? Or what do you support? And then bring it back up at the very end to yeah. tie it in. See, that's why you're the <laughs> communications... And just for anyone, if you want to practice or you want to run ideas by me, please feel free. I'm more than happy to help wherever I can. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me or you can reach out to Trayla. Um, she knows how to get a hold of me too. Um, but thank you guys for the time this morning. Kelly, thank you. And Kelly actually is not feeling well. So I'm so grateful that you were able to still make the call and do this training under uh, how you're feeling today. So I appreciate you. Uh, I know you you want to rest. So um, <laughs> unless <laughs> if people have questions, then um, they can put them in the chat or come off mute. Um, but yeah, uh, right. some comments.
Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And Kelly, I think someone wants to slide. So if that's okay, I'll send them out to the group once this yep. is over. I'll send them to Sharela. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And now I would like to, well, actually, I'll have Alan introduce Megan because they've worked together already. No, thank you. And thanks, Kelly. That was great. Um, appreciate that. And have to think about my my personal connections more to these things, but but um, our next speaker is Megan Denise, um, who's below me on the screen here, and she is our um, grants manager in the Department of Family Medicine, and she's also the man, sort of the the um, division administrative lead for our research division that we have here. Um, she previously worked in in the research institute here at KU Med Center. And if anybody's not a KU Med Center person here, that's kind of our grants management office, which is a big office that, that kind of processes things for the entire institution here. And to some of us um, that have worked with that office a lot over the years, it's kind of like a black hole sometimes <laughs> and a spooky place where all sorts of magical things happen, but that many of us don't know about. So it's been awesome for us in family medicine to have Megan come from that is that that administrative unit over to our team and start working with us and what she's found um and i think she was attracted to us in the first place because she knew we were doing community work and she has a history of doing community work herself but recently we did a couple really big grants with community partners specifically the wyandotte county health department and i think it was a really interesting experience because they were a very naive um, grant submitting entity and Megan coached them along <laughs> in a lot of ways and helped them a ton. And the grants would have never made it out of their door to the feds if it wasn't for her. So I thought she could come and talk a little bit about her experiences in seeing faculty do this work where they've got a community partner, seeing a situation where the community partner is kind of leading a grant but also having to interface with an academic institution like ours. Um, and I'm hopeful that this can maybe be just be the start of, of some things we could do periodically out of this MAR group um, to, you know, to help anyone who's, who's, who's new to solving these problems around these collaborative grants, because there, there can be some major problems, as, as I'm sure many of you know, um, and we might even be able to get some side help from Megan from time to time, <laughs> just because we, we're all meeting monthly and talking through these things. So I will turn it over to you, Megan, and, and, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say, and maybe we can have a little discussion, too, at the end. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Let me uh, screen share here. And... There we go. Can you see my screen? Okay. Oops. Are you all able to see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect. So um, as Dr. Greiner said, I am the grant manager for the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. Uh, from my time at SPA, though, I can see a lot of familiar names, and a lot of you are already engaged with community partners, some of you quite extensively. So um, hopefully this is a bit of new information. If not, let me know what the questions are. So when thinking about who are community partners, it's it's more than just um, you know, small businesses, nonprofits, LLCs. It also includes state and local government, tribal nations and tribal organizations, uh, individuals, faith-based organizations, and foundations. And that is not even an inclusive list of everything. Um, it's really finding people who are living and working in the community or organizations that are working in the community and uh, they would be considered a community partner. But why do we want to collaborate with community partners in the beginning? Um, as I said, these are people or organizations that are living and working within the target population or area that you would want your research to be conducted in. They offer insight and it also helps uh, increase recruitment and retention. If you have a contact in the community, if you have someone who, if there is another language spoken within the community, 
if there are cultural expectations, if you have someone on the team who speaks the language, knows the culture, is part of the community themselves, you are much more likely to have your, your population that you're working with maintain throughout the course of the research and not have to keep going back for recruitment. You all know the science, but the community knows their own needs. They know their population and they know the areas where they need growth and then they need support. And having successful power partnerships empowers communities. It allows them to have the resources to lead the charge for their own sustainability. So when we're looking at research that's supporting communities, having someone at the table who is part of that community should be an essential part. It's mutually beneficial for both the academic institution and the community to have a partnership. So when we have no community involvement, it's working off history. It, it seems as though the academic institution is in control of what is happening with uh, the supports they're providing. But as you move more towards the right side of the arrow here, it becomes more community involvement. The community is sharing resources with the institution. Um, the institution is sharing resources with the community. They're building a a foundation of trust and partnership. And as that goes, the, the ultimate goal is for community-driven and community-led research opportunities. And this is also true um, if you go to grants.gov right now and you were to search um, just open funding opportunities, there are over a thousand opportunities that are specific to um, Nonprofits, LLCs, uh, community partners such as health and uh, health departments, or um, tribal organizations and tribal nations, and academic institutions are not eligible to apply for these opportunities. So, if you were to find an opportunity that is limited in that way, um, knowing but you know, oh, I have this wonderful idea. This is how we could work with tobacco cessation in tribal populations in rural Kansas on the reservation. And, but that opportunity is limited. Knowing who to work with in that community could help get your research supporting those communities and doing the work without having necessarily to be the prime applicant. There are some, while there are many benefits to having community partners and it should be part of the research. If you're working in the, re, if you're working in the community, if you're proposing science to better the community, knowing the community is essential. However, there are some challenges that can arise. For example, when working with the Wyandotte County Health Department, it was things that we don't have to always consider at an academic institution. Do they have a negotiated indirect rate? If they don't, what is the sponsor guidelines? Do they use the de minimis rate of 10%? If it's a foundation, what are their guidelines for using indirects? How do they determine their indirect rate? Having to provide that kind of support. Another consideration to make is what is their flow of revenue going to look like? So if we are the prime and they are a sub award or a consultant, um, knowing that sometimes there's delays in sending funding. If your partner is 100% reliant on salary coming from grant support, having open and honest conversations with them, planning ahead as far as we, the institution is going to be closed during these weeks. So you need to make sure to invoice us well ahead of time so that the salary support that comes directly from the grant for your personnel is not delayed. There's also the consideration of allowability of costs. Many of us know office supplies are not an allowable cost normally for federal grants unless specific to that award and you have to justify it. However, that's not always something that a community partner might know. So really going through and breaking down, yes, we recognize that transportation is an area of concern 
for this type of research. However, the grant does not allow for purchase towards gas or purchasing a car, et cetera. So it's kind of a dance of finding a way to meet the needs and the support but also staying in line with the grants and being very clear about what's going to be allowed. Another thing to consider is support. What support do the community partners have in place? As was mentioned in Kelly's um, presentation, and I'm glad I went after that because a lot of this applies. Knowing that not everyone speaks grant, um, knowing what a PI is, knowing what a co-PI is, knowing what an indirect rate is, so being able to have someone who can kind of translate the guidelines into, this is exactly what you need to do. This is what a bio sketch is. This is what the bio sketch is explicitly asking for. You know, um, this is what a letter of support typically includes. It's, it's a different level of support than if you're working with another institution who maybe has a spa office, who has, Someone like me who works directly with the departments and helps them prepare their documents. And this applies both when your institution is the prime and when the community partners are the prime. Even if they are the ones submitting the application, sometimes you still need to go through and detail out this is what they're looking for. This is what they mean when they say flatten the PDF and um, helping them get the grant compiled together and out the door and including all of the necessary pieces. Another thing to consider that is not always something that has to be considered when going institution to institution or just submitting a grant without community partners is the time. Um, everything will take longer than you might think it will. So um, when we were working on the Wyandotte County Health Department grants, it was explaining that our portion of the grant, even though we aren't the prime applicant, has to go through our spa office. And that takes at least a week and they have to provide feedback and we have to get it in by this date. So it's not as simple as we can just say, yes, here's our, here's our pieces, it can go out the door. Also being upfront about how long things take to set up, um, if going through your sponsored programs office or your research contracts office, it's not the grant is here, the NOAA is here, we're ready to go. Um, being upfront that it takes time to get contracts negotiated and fully executed. Um, conversations you might not assume you would have to have are conversations that are necessary to have uh, when working with community partners. So I am fortunate that the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health, when I started my job almost a year ago, they already had extensive established community partnerships uh, on a local, state, national, and global level. Um, right now, the department currently supports over 50 partnerships focusing on supporting health equity across Kansas, specifically supporting rural areas. That's the COPE Award from Dr. Kessler, which is CDC funded with uh, KDHE is the prime, and we are a sub. And this work would not be possible without ha having these partnerships with community health workers, organizations, tribal governments, tribal organizations, to ensure that Kansans in rural areas, Kansans, regardless of their socioeconomic status, ethnicity, race, what have you, are receiving equitable health care. And without having people in the communities, we would not, it would not have grown it the way it has. We also have support um, through tribal governments and tribal organizations. I know Dr. Greiner was extensively involved with that as well as Christina Pacheco, who is a member of the Cherokee Nation. And so um, it's also looking at ensuring your faculty have relationships and are going out and building those partnerships and building that trust. Um, our department also supports multiple appointed county health officials, including Dr. Greiner, Dr. Lee Master, and Dr. Corvo. 
Um, we also support grants in Kenya. And one of the things about working with international partners is especially looking at budgeting, taking into account exchange rates, uh, taking into account that many sponsors, especially federal sponsors, have specific guidelines as far as this is how much you can ask for indirect rates if you're a foreign entity. So, and also a lot of times kind of going through, this is what the guidelines are expecting. Um, and then uh, again, because we are a clinical department, we have many clinicians providing care already in the community. So reaching out to clinicians who are serving populations, seeing what the areas of concern are and building those partnerships together there. So who do you contact if you want more information? There is my email. It's just mdenise at kumc.edu. If you're like, hey, that, that work being done for COPE sounded really interesting, or I'm interested in learning more about global community partnerships, um, if you reach out to me, I can get you directed to the faculty with the most experience who can provide additional guidance and as well as uh, information from me. So uh, what questions are there for me, if any? Thanks, Megan, that was good. And and I think, you, you know, you've, especially with that COPE project, you've had a, a lot of experience interfacing with all kinds of individuals and entities. Um, do you have a, do you have a feeling out of that, like which, which entities are some of the toughest to, to, that you have to sort of translate lots of sort of <laughs> material for? Uh, yes. So um, a lot of times faith-based organizations, because uh, um, when we're setting partners up in our workday system, it's you send them a blank W-9 in a supplier agreement form. And both of those are very intimidating to fill out. So it's getting questions back also that you may not know how to answer. Like I had a faith-based organization ask me what box they needed to check on their W-9 for how they should be classified. I have no idea, but I did some research and I talked to them and we went through it and I talked to an accountant and we figured it out. So sometimes it's, it's knowing that this community partner, the work that they are doing, the support that they are able to provide, the access to the community that you get through this pathway, it's worth the 20 minute conversation to figure out what box they need to check on their W-9. Um, and it's, it's also recognizing that sometimes you just have to provide the additional support if you want the grant to go out the door because they don't have department support the way a lot of institutions do. So if you want the, if you want the grant to go out the door, the team has to be all hands on deck. Great points. I know some of us had experience with that exact thing, e even with our, our good friend, Broderick Crawford and, and his organization. He mm -hmm. would often say, we need support. <laughs> Yes, and um, I think I think the biggest takeaway is really having someone who can sit with the partner and be like, this is exactly what I'm looking for from you. I create an application guide for every grant that goes out the door from family medicine, but I also create it for our subawards and community partners. So what that basically looks like is I go through and I say, you need to send me a bio sketch. Here's exactly what the bio sketch looks like. Here's a link to the directions. Here's a link to um, a template for this. If you need to provide other support, this is exactly the information I will need for other support so that our community partners aren't wondering, I know I'm part of this grant, but what do you need for me? So for me, having application guides to send out sub awards consultants um however they're classified has been really helpful and i'm happy to share an example of um both the application guide for the prime applicant and if we have community partner subs i will email you for an application guide template please megan <laughs> yes absolutely 
I just have a question. I think, thank you so much, Megan, for, for your presentation. Are these types of materials something that we might consider like hosting on the Frontiers website or our partnering institutions? But I think it might be a great way for uh, researchers and community partners who are part of the Frontiers Network to kind of have a one-stop shop um, for all of the resources that they might need to partner on a on an application. I think it would be incredibly helpful too, um, Sharayla, as we're thinking about the Broderick Crawford mini grants so thinking about all of the things that they'll need to have in place to submit those awards. I agree, Andrea, and I'm so glad that we have, uh, I have Kelly on the line. She's, uh, as mentioned, our communications coordinator, and I know that we are working on a toolkit for our, our website, which is still fairly new, and we're still working out some kinks in it, but I, I think that's awesome, and, and that's why I'm like, Megan, I will be emailing you for that application guide template. Um, I have a small list of things that I would like to go in the toolkit, Andrea, and I know we've discussed things in our leadership meeting as well, um, but yes, I agree, and, and I think we'll be compiling, as time goes on, we'll just keep compiling more things. I don't know what that's going to look like, but um, oh, Kelly, you're there. I'm like, what looks different? No, I'm still here. Um, definitely can add links, documents, um, any of that to the toolkit. Um, so if people have ideas too that they think should be in there, um, send them to Sharela and we can do like one big upload edition at the same time. Thank you, Kelly. Other questions, comments? I was just going to say this was really helpful. Um, I was thinking kind of putting all of this together is with the the new pilot uh, awards named after Broderick, um, maybe using that pilot period as an opportunity for community partners to begin collecting the kind of information that would be needed for a full grant application, even though each funding source acts for something a little bit different in a little bit different um, format. Um, it, it's, I think the intimidating part a lot of times for community organizations and for us, frankly, is just the, the quick turnaround that we often need and having things kind of ready that we can just update or um, modify, I think might be a useful use of the grant of the pilot. Yeah, I was just thinking about too, sometimes you even get into this process where if you get to like the just in time phase of an award, you got to do a lot of a lot of IRB stuff sometimes when you get to that point and the, the funder wants that done. And that's that's a whole nother set of supports for some of our community partners who may not have experience with with IRB and the different trainings and um and we do have, you know, we do have this community facing IRB training now called certification at here at KU Med Center. If the if you folks don't know about that, um, we'll keep pitching that. We're getting more and more community folks to do that. But um, there's a there's a lot of a lot of things that go into that too, and it's a whole other layer. Can you share a little more information about that? Yeah, um, actually, Sherela can probably plop it in the chat. Um, we we um, we've talked about this for a while, and then wrote it into the renewal of 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 this Frontiers grant. And it it turns out other institutions were thinking about this too. So we found that the University of Illinois Chicago had already developed a community facing uh, human subjects protection training program. So similar to city training that we institutionally have to do at KUMC and that many other institutions around the country use, but ta essentially tailored to folks who aren't as experienced with research and come with a, a more of a community lens. 
And so it's spelled C-I-R-T-ification. So certification is the name of it. I can't remember what that all stands for. I don't know if you remember, Sharela. But, <laughs> but I think about 20 different um, clinical translational science institutes around the country are now using it for community partner training. Um, and it's, it's a, I think it's been pretty well received by the people we've had. I think we have something like 25 to 30 community folks who have now done it. Um, but our hope is that it, that it becomes real widely used and nobody has to mess with getting a, getting access to city and, and having a, a license to do that. That I, I understand that can be done, but our IRB here was, it was concerned that sometimes there's a cost related to that and things like that. So this replaces that essentially. So the link that's in the chat, it, it, it looks kind of daunting. It's on the, the bottom right side. It's community involvement and research training. That's what the CIRT stands for, certification. Um, like you mentioned, you can learn more by clicking the bottom right. And if you have questions, you can just reach out to me and I'll get on the phone and uh, we could talk about it briefly or via email, whatever works. I'm actually chatting with Kelly now about putting together a blurb for our next Marg news, not Marg, excuse me, Frontiers. The Frontiers newsletter looks amazing. Not like the Marg little weekly thing that we do. So, you know, the, the Frontiers newsletter is professionally done by a communications coordinator and it looks really, really good. So, um, um, and as you notice, if you're in the chat, Andrea says that those, the city training modules are now available in Spanish. And I believe certification they were working on, uh, oh, it's in Spanish and it's also in, um, I can't read the language to tell you what language it's in. Um, there might be someone with more experience than me. But anyway, um, and also um, thank you, Jill, for letting us know. So the certification training takes about four to five hours. So from the repair project, the uh, community partner, that it, it, it was still a heavy lift. Um, it's not as heavy as city training, obviously, but it is still a heavy lift. And so one of the things that we have discussed um, is if there is a group of people that want to do it, trying to do it all together at the same time so that questions that people have, um, if there's someone um, there that can answer them for everyone and even just help them along with the quizzes that happen, like, do you, what part, what about this question? Can I make more clear to you and, and things like that? Um, Jill, did you want to speak more about that? I was just going to say there's a quiz at the end and our group was going to walk through the, that final quiz together. Everyone was logged in. So you have to log in and identify which CTSI you're affiliated with. So I walked through all of that, wrote out um, instructions. So when our group, some of our group did meet and we got to that final quiz, it's individualized. I think they're the same questions, but they're different order in a different order. So you cannot do that final quiz together, um, walk through that together, because if everyone's on their own computers, they have different questions. So just just to give you a heads up about that. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. As someone who went through it individually, mm -hmm. I yeah, yeah. OK. This is why we need team science, guys. Mm -hmm. I do have a few announcements if there's no more questions or comments. Um, and Alan, I know you had something also to say, but Kathy wanted me to share with everyone um, before she left, I'm just gonna share my screen really quickly um, about some information about Gilda's Club and the Masonic Cancer Alliance. So can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Uh, as you can see here, they are having their annual meeting Friday, March 31st, and um, we, you are invited. So the link will be in the chat shortly. And also, Gilda's Club is having their annual Giggle with Gilda with Justin Willman, and they have tickets that range from, I think, $25 all the way up to VIP, which are like $80 or something like that. Um but yeah, both of those things you wanted me to announce, and I will also put them in the chat. 
and I'll stop sharing. And Alan, you, I will leave the floor, give the floor back to you. I think you had some announcements. So yeah, the main thing I wanted to bring up was something you've already brought up, which was the the Broderick Crawford um, Community Participation Award Program. We're hoping to finalize that in this next month. And so we'll be doing some public publicity around that, but hope that some of you can help us spread the word, uh, especially to community partners that might have needs for small chunks of funding to, to further their work or to expand partnerships or enhance their teams or do anything that, you know, that's, that's good in the community that can, you know, can facilitate research over time. Um, the, the, the awards can't officially fund research itself because we need all sorts of federal level approval if we give out funds and do that. But we're, we're hopeful that they can, um, they can do other good things to, to stimulate uh, work that everybody's, you know, wanting to develop and stretch in new and innovative ways. So you'll be hearing more about those in the coming, in the coming weeks. Uh, and, and what we're, we're going to rely, I think we're going to rely heavily on the MARG and, and all of your partners to get the word out and and get those funds spent and and to see how it goes as i think as terry was saying it, it's kind of a it's kind of a pilot effort for us to see how this goes too so um we'll be bumping into some of the things megan is was mentioning i think as we do that but uh because we'll that'll that whole program will end up being sort of invoice based uh for for the community partner side of it probably but uh we may, you know, we may have to ask Megan some questions as we go, but uh, we'll figure it out. And and so we'll have more word on that. That was the major thing I wanted to mention. Um, Shreya, do we have a next meet and greet set up? I don't know if we set a next Marg meet and greet, but. I was still muted. Okay, no, we have not set one yet. Uh, you and I will talk about that in our one-on-one -on -one tomorrow. And we're, we were going to do some something additional with that. What were we talking about? We wanted to do a real push around the, the mini grant to tie yeah. it into the meet and greet and perhaps have it at the Daiquiri Bistro. And because that was where Broderick wanted to do our holiday party and we were never able to do our holiday party. Awesome. So we probably will recruit some other friends of Broderick for that uh, event is what we were sort of talking about and, and make it fun. Um, so we'll and have his a family day for that. Yes, yes, that's right. I forgot about that. So yeah, yeah, we're talking about asking some of his family, like his brother, to potentially come if they can, and others. So more to come on that. Uh, next month, I don't know if you, um, those of you that work at KU Med, if you saw in the newsletter that went out last week. Um, Jaime uh, Perales Pouchot was talking about their text messaging program that they're doing. Well, he's actually coming to Mark next month to talk about the development and the testing of that. And so I'm really excited for that. Um, because when we when I put this on our calendar, it was not all the way completed yet. And so now it is complete. So I'm really interested to hear what he has to say next month. So if you know anyone that would be interested in that, please let them know to join us next month. And I think we are good to go. If you have any other announcements, please let me know and I'll make sure that they get into our MARG newsletter. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day, a dry day. Yes. Thanks. Thank you again. Thanks, Thanks Megan. Megan. <laughs>